So let me pray for us and let's jump in because I'm telling you, God put a word on my heart that I, I cannot keep quiet. I've been so excited to come today to share this with you. And I hope you're cool with going like old school Pentecostal three hour style because because <laughs> I can't keep this shut up inside me anymore. OK. All right, God, we come to you right now, Lord Jesus, and I just thank you so much for your presence here today. God, I thank you that, that we get to come into your house and worship your name. And God, I thank you that your omnipresence is everywhere. That's amazing. But God, I truly thank you for your manifest presence that showed up here today. God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is here in this house right now, and it's here and it's prepared to change lives. God, I thank you that every single person that walked in here today expecting to meet with you, that you are here ready to meet with them. God, I just pray that right now you just start to open the hearts, the minds, and the ears of every person sitting in this room, and that they will get a fresh revelation of who you are, and that we will leave different than we came in because we've encountered you. God, I thank you that I personally don't have anything worthwhile to say, but you do, and I thank you for using me anyway. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. I mean, you guys say amen good, like you've been practicing. <laughs> good for you. So let me, let me explain to you. I told you that I, I've been gone the last five weeks. I've been home for one day. Let me kind of explain that to you, okay? So the last uh, five weeks, four weeks ago, five weeks ago, uh, I was out on a tour called the Lost 80s Live Tour. And what this is, it's a, a tour of a lot of 80s bands. Um, that maybe some of you remember, like Flock of Seagulls, uh, Wang Chung. Everybody have fun tonight. Everybody Wang Chung. Okay, all right. So I was out on that tour, and I was out on that tour, and people were writing me like, did you quit preaching? Like, what happened? Are you rock and roll? What's... <laughs> because, see, 12 years ago, for a living, what I did was I was a tour manager. I used to tour with a lot of big rock bands and travel the country, and that, that was what my, my life was. Uh, but I'm a preacher now. I'm, I'm not in rock and roll. So people are like, why were you doing that again? Let me back it up a little bit. About three months ago, I'm in my church, and during the afternoons, what I like to do is just go to my church and just walk through the sanctuary and pray. I do this every single day around 10 a.m., and I'm doing that, and I'm praying, and I heard God as loud as day. It was, I'm not saying it was audible, but, man, it might as well have been. It was so clear. And this is what God said to me. He said, pack your bags, get ready to go when they call say yes. I was like, excuse me? He said, pack your bags, get ready to go. When they call, say yes. I'm like, who is it? A travel agent? Where am I going? Hawaii? Like, okay, that sounds amazing. I'm in, right? Didn't know what it meant. Didn't know. And, and for two months, I didn't know. No one ever called. I'm like, you ever hear God? And then you think, I didn't hear God. I missed it. That was just, that was just me, right? Two months goes by and I get a phone call from a guy in the music industry that I used to work with a long time ago back in the day. And he called me and he said, hey, man, I, I know you're a preacher now. <laughs> I know that you don't do this anymore at all. But uh, the band Wang Chung needs a tour manager really bad for this tour. It's like an emergency and we need somebody. And I knew you could do it. I just didn't know if, if you would want to, if you were able to. And my first thought is, no. <laughs> I don't want to do it. That is, that is not what we, in my 20s, yeah, put me out on the road, send me out. That's a great time, rock and roll, yeah. I have a wife and four kids. I do not want to be gone that long. That's not what I want to do, right? I love Jesus. I don't want to be around all that. But then I remembered, pack your bags, get ready to go. When they call, say yes. So I said yes. I said, yeah, I'll do it. Because honestly, in my mind, I thought, there's no way my wife's going to let me go. <laughs> So, yeah, man, I'll do it. Let me talk to my wife, and I'll call you right back with a no. I remember I called my wife. I was like, hey, you're never going to guess what happened. And I told her, and she's like, you should totally go. I was like, what? No, don't say that. She's like, no. She's like, it's a great opportunity. Why would you not do that? And I'm like, yeah, why would I not do that? So, but that's okay because I had a backup plan because, you see, I'm the staff evangelist at my church. Right? That means I am on staff there, and they send me out to churches to preach. So wherever I go, the church lifeway where I'm a part of is attached to me. There's no way my pastor is going to send me out on a rock and roll tour. <laughs> I go and tell him. I'm like, hey, man, this is what's going on. Totally cool. If you don't want me to go, I get it. Like, it's, I'll call him right now. He's like, no. He's like, you should go. 
You should totally go. And I'm like, you don't understand. I don't want to. But here's the thing, man. Here's the thing. In Matthew 5, 14, Jesus tells us, you are the light of the world. You. Once you have Jesus, see, Jesus is the light of the world. But once you have him inside of you, now you are the light of the world. And your job is to go and be light. And I hope I don't hurt your feelings, but your light doesn't do any good in church. This is a very bright place. Your light in here does no good. No one can see it. Everyone's bright in here. You know where your light does a lot of good? In the darkness. In the darkness. And what God was saying is this time you've been preaching it, you've been telling everybody in the world about it, it's time to go do it. See, God told me a long time, he said, I'm going to make you an influencer into the music world, into the celebrity world. And he's done it a little bit, but never like this. And I said, all right, I'm going to go. And I packed my bags. I got on a plane and I flew out to meet this tour. And within one day of being out there, I told God, this is not what I want to do. (laughs) I'm telling you, 22 year old me would have been in heaven. It was amazing out there, right? But me now, not so much. The the drugs and the alcohol and the the sex and the, the whatever, everything that was out there. I'm like, God, this is not me anymore. This is filthy. This is ridiculous. I was like, I don't want to be around this. I was like, this hurts my heart to even be out here. And God said to me, he said, Kelly, he said, you're in this world, but you're not of it. Right? (laughs) And I said, God, that encourages me about this much because I know that. (laughs) I already know that, God, no big deal. (laughs) But then he said something that, that changed my perspective and it changed my life probably forever. That, that literally the way that I see any situation now is completely changed, and I hope that it changes you. If you're taking notes, this is probably the first thing I'd write down. And if you're not taking notes, you won't get into heaven because I talk to God. <laughs> and you need notes from today to get in. <laughs> but here's what God told me. I said, it doesn't help me that I'm, I'm in this world. I'm not of it. I get that. And God said, think about Paul. When Paul wrote Philippians, I'm like, yeah, what about it? <laughs> It's like Philippians is one of the happiest books in the Bible. Amazing book of the Bible, right? I love it. He said, where did Paul write that? I said, in prison, right? He said, you see, Paul had a choice. Paul could have seen himself that he was chained to that guard. Or he could change his perspective and seen that that guard was chained to him. He said, it's all about how you see the situation you're in, Kelly. He said, are you chained to this tour or is this tour chained to you? He said, are you stuck being in this tour for four weeks or is that tour stuck to you for four weeks? That changed everything in an instant. I'm not stuck being out here with this filth. This filth is stuck to me for the next four weeks. Because here's the thing. At the end of four weeks, I don't need this job. I'm a preacher. I'm not a tour manager. This isn't what I do anymore. I don't care what happens. I don't care if they hate me. I don't care if they never ask me back again. You're going to be stuck to me for four weeks, though. Because let me tell you, there's so many of you in this room right now that you live this every single day. You're like, you know what, man, I want to get closer to God. I want a better relationship with him. But I just, if I could just get out of this situation, things would be better. If I could just leave this job, then I could really get closer to God. You do not understand, Kelly, the people that I'm around every day. You don't understand Karen. Every, your worship pastor's name is Karen. Judy, you do not, sorry. <laughs> you do not understand what Judy does to me every day. If I could get away from her, I could get closer to God. No, let me tell you what. You are not chained to your job. Your job is chained to you. You are not chained to Judy or Karen. Karen and Judy are chained to you. Stop waiting for a change in your circumstances so you can get closer to God. Go and be the change in that circumstance and let God change everything around you. Amen? Man, that changed everything for me. It did. That, the rest of that tour was such a joy. I was just happy. I was so excited to be there. It was insane. It was just like a light switch went off. So I I prayed to God. When that happened, I was like, all right, God, what do I do? Do I just go preach boldly, like rock and roll revival? Like I was ready. I got my Bible. Let's go, God. Let's show these rock stars what's up. And God said, yeah, you you can do that if you want to get kicked off and sent home. (laughs) Because these rock stars, the last thing they need is one more person telling them that they're going to hell. 
Because the world is already doing that. He said, so you can do that if you want, Kelly. He said, or you can just go love them like I would. <laughs> yeah. He said, you can just go serve them. Just serve them. Because here's the thing. What I realized is that I can't change them anyway. You, you can't change anyone. You can't save anyone. Only Jesus can. The only thing you can do is love them to the one who can. And that's Jesus. Right? So I said, all right, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go love them and serve them. But here's the thing with a tour. All right, on a tour, everyone has a certain job, and you only do that job. When that job is over, you, you bail out. Like, that's it. You just go sit around and do that job. So I was like, okay, what do I do? What can I do? I was the tour manager for Wang Chung. That means I just work for them. The first thing I noticed is that rock stars destroy dressing rooms. <laughs> You've probably seen it in movies. That's for real. <laughs> that's not a joke. So I just started cleaning dressing rooms. Every night I would go into every band's dressing room and just clean it. Throw away beer bottles, trash, whatever. And after a couple days, I noticed the bands were filming me. <laughs> they were like, we ain't never seen a tour manager do this. Like, like this guy is crazy, right? I'm tell and then what I started doing was just anything that one of the band members needed from any band, not just mine, I would help them. They needed water on stage, I would go get it. They needed a towel, I would find it. I would go, I would run errands for them, for anybody, whatever it was. It wasn't my job, I would just go do it. And by the end of the tour, these guys would come up to me and they were giving me hugs and they were like, thank you so much. Like, we've never seen anybody like you. Like, we don't understand why you do this. And here's the thing, did I get to personally pray with every single one of them? No, I didn't. But you know what I did get to do? I got to build a relationship with them. These guys are my friends now on social media. And they've already, I've seen them starting to, you see what I post on social media. <laughs> I, I am pretty bold in what I post on social media. They're watching my videos and they're commenting on them. Now these are guys that would normally skip over anything with a preacher, but I'm not a preacher to them now. That's Kelly. That's the guy that went and got me a towel when I needed it. That's, the, that's my friend. That's the guy that helped me when I needed help. Now they'll watch and pay attention. Why? Because I'm not somebody yelling at them, preaching God to them. I'm their friend. I planted some seed. Amen? So God is good, and uh, I was excited to be out there on that tour, and that's, that's kind of what happened. Um, but another thing, another thing kind of took place, and this is where I'm really excited uh, to get into, and I, I'm going to try to hurry. I want to be honoring of your time. I promise I do. But, but let, me just, let me just preface this right here and say this, I, I, I'm, I'm an evangelist, meaning it's my job to come and encourage you, okay? I come and encourage. What I'm about to share with you was a story that happened. This is a journey that took place on this tour that changed me forever. And it was God ended up doing a lot of correction in me through this. Uh, but here's the thing about correction is that it stings and it hurts but it brought me to a freedom that I've never had before. And it brought me to a blessing that I've never had before. We sang a song today about breaking chains. What I'm about to walk you through broke so many chains off my life that I didn't even know were there. So I'm not here to correct you. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm here to encourage you, but let me encourage you this way. I'm just gonna share with you my story. If God wants to correct you, let me encourage you, let him. Let him. It might sting, it might hurt, but it's going to be worth it. The freedom and the blessing on the other side will be worth it. Amen? Some of you are like, I don't want to say amen to that. <laughs> I want to go. Matter of fact, if you want to leave, I'm going to give you a free chance right now. You can go ahead and go because it's going to get a little thick in here, but that's all right. Okay? So I told God before I went on this tour, if I'm going to be gone from my family for four weeks, I want you to wreck my life. I'm going to spend the next four weeks getting as close to you as I can because I don't have a church. I don't have my family. So I'm going to just press into you as hard as I can. If you pray, God, wreck my life, and you mean it, be careful, he will. Okay? So that's what I prayed, and that's exactly what happened. And here's how it started. It was like day three of this tour. We were in San Antonio, Texas, and there was all these famous people that had come to watch the show, and the backstage area was completely packed. It was too many people. I did not have a chair. I actually sent a picture to my wife. I think it's on Facebook of me looking sad, and I just said, I has no chair. Uh, <laughs> Couldn't sit. I was tired. I couldn't sit down. So I said, you know what, whatever. I'm just going to go to the front where all the fans are and just watch the rest of the show. 
So I've got my backstage pass on to make sure I can get back. And I walk out to where all the, the fans are watching. And as soon as I get out there, this, this lady sees me and she sees my pass. And she's like, hey, hey, you, you, do you work back there? <laughs> and I'm like, well, kind of. Like, I don't work for the tour. Like, I'm Wang Chung's tour manager. I didn't say that. out, So I was just like, yeah, kind of. She's like, ah, like looking around me to see if anyone better is there. <laughs> I guess I'm not cute enough. And uh, she's like, I'm trying to find Wang Chung, the band where I'm trying to meet Wang Chung. In my mind, I'm like, you actually found the only person that could help me. Like, what luck for you, right? Like, how lucky could you be? And she's like, I'm really good friends with Wang Chung. They're like my best friends. Like every time they come to town, we hang out. I'm always on their tour bus. Like we party together. Like they know me. We're best friends. And I'm just trying to get back there looking for me. And I'm about to be like, well, hey, you're in luck. I'm the guy. Let's go. And I'm about to say that. And then she says something that changed everything. She said, I don't really need you. I can do this on my own. I normally can do this on my own. And in that moment, I said, then do it. Good luck. See you later. That was it. I let her go. I was about to take her to the band. I don't need you. I can normally do this on my own. All right, have a good night. And I walked away. And I watched her walk around looking for somebody better. <laughs> really, I'm literally the only person that can help you. I'm the only one that can take you to this band. If you find someone else, guess who they're going to bring you to? Me. <laughs> right? So it, it was kind of funny. I was kind of laughing at her, whatever. After the show, I went back to the band. I was telling them, I was explaining them to her, like, hey, your friend is here. Uh, this is what she looks like, da, 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 da. And they were like, who? I was like, your friend, you know, your friend that's here that you hang out with all the time. I explained, they're like, we don't know her. <laughs> we have no idea. But I'm like, no, she knows everything about you. Like, she was like dead on. Like, everything she said lined up. Like, if... If it were up to me, she knows you. Like she knew more than I did about you. And like, nope, don't know her. And then like a ton of bricks dropped on my head. Matthew 7, 21 hit me in the face. Let me show it to you. Do you have it on the Sky Bible? Hey, there's me. Hi. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons. And in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Man, that, that hit me so hard, I can't even begin to tell you. Because well, let's, let's time out and look at this for a minute. First off, she came looking to meet with the band. She found the one person who can help her. How many times do we go needing something from God and we run into the Holy Spirit, the one person who can help us, and as soon as he says something to us that we don't like, we say, I don't need you. I can normally do this on my own. And let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, and he will gladly step aside and let you try to do it on your own. And I saw that picture and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is what people do all the time. But let me tell you what crushed me is when I realized Matthew 7, 21 is not just talking about any people. This says, this says we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We perform miracles in your name. Do you, do you see what's happening here? These are Christians. These are people sitting in church every single day that Jesus is going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't know you. Oh, that stings. That's there are people coming to church every day. And here's what's happening. Here's what I realized with that lady. She was a fan of the band, not a friend. She was a fan, not a friend. And what I realized is that the church has a problem today. We have a lot of fans of Jesus and not many friends of Jesus. Yeah. No, that's, that's preaching better than your amening, but that's okay. We'll, we'll work on it later. <laughs> a lot of fans, not a lot of friends. And when I realized that, I started doing some checks in myself. I said, okay, God, I, that kind of scares me a little bit. How do I make sure, God, that I am your friend and not a fan? Because I'm telling you what, when I get to heaven, I do not want God to ever look at me and be like, who are you? Right? I don't want that to happen. So I started, I started praying, all right, God, how do I know 
I want to know. Because how many of you in this room would love to know that you are for sure a friend of Jesus and not a fan? <laughs> Me too, right? So what I did was I started looking up scriptures that talked about being a friend of God, a friend of Jesus. I figured uh, if I want to know more about Jesus, the Bible is a good place to start. So the very first scripture I found was John 15, 14. Do we have that up there? It says, you are my friends if you do what I command. That's easy enough. I said, okay, but what did you command? So let's back up a little bit. John 15, starting in verse 12, it says this. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I've heard that scripture a million times. I think that I've actually like wanted to go get that as a tattoo with a friend, like matching tattoos, like lay it on your life for your friends, right? Like we've all heard that scripture and it's like a best friend scripture. Like that's our, that's our scripture. Me and my wife, yay, we love each other, lay down our lives. But that, I don't think that's what the scripture is saying at all. When I really read it, what it's saying is, Jesus is saying, hey, you're my friends if you, if you do what I command. Okay, what do I command? What he's saying is, you're my friend, so I laid down my life for you. You want to be my friend? Lay down yours for me. You want to be my friend? Lay down your life. But here's what happens. We come to church and we get saved, right? Yes, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. And then Monday morning, we go right back to everything we've ever done. And nothing changed. We didn't lay down our life at all. Now we keep coming to church. We keep coming to the club. We learn all about Jesus. We become really good fans. But here's the thing about being a fan versus a friend is that you can be a fan of about whatever. We got a lot of fans of, of celebrities, right? And you can know everything about them. You can go to every, like, like, for a while, we all loved Kevin Durant, right? Did we not? We, you can admit we used to. I said used to. Did we not used to love Kevin Durant? We knew everything about him, right? He was awesome. But if you saw Kevin Durant on the street and you're like, yo, Kevin, he'd be like, uh, who, who are you? But then also, as soon as Kevin Durant does something you don't like, like change cities, are you a fan now? Oh, because if you're not friends with somebody, as soon as they do something that you're not too keen of, it's real easy to bail out. And you see a lot of Christians that bail out, and that's because they were just a fan and not really a friend. Yeah. A lot harder to bail out on your friends. So I read this, and I get it. I was like, okay, God, lay down your life for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done that. I'm a preacher. I was like, this is awesome, God. Thank you. I was just praising him. Thank God I've laid down my life for you. We are friends. I've laid down everything. And God said, kind of. <laughs> I said, what? Like, that hurt. Like, it stung. Like, I, he said, kind of, to me. You kind of have done that. And I was like, whoa, what do you mean? And I'm telling you right now, it's about to get real in here. And if you want to leave, go for it. Well, this is what God said to me. He said, yeah, you kind of had he said, there are sins in your life that you tolerate every single day. He said, you tolerate sin in your life and they keep you from intimacy with me. Because here's the thing for the last, man, I'll say over a year, my prayer every day is, God, I just want intimacy with you. I want to see you face to face. I want to be so close to you. I want you to talk to me. I want intimacy with you. And it felt like I was hitting a wall every single time I prayed that prayer. I just wasn't getting any closer to him. Does anyone ever feel that way? Like you just want to get closer to God, but you just, you're hitting a wall. You can't get there. And God said, there's sins in your life that you're tolerating. And it's keeping you from intimacy with me. And I want to tell you today in here, in this room, every single one of you, there are sins in your life that you are tolerating that are keeping you from intimacy with God. The next thing that he showed me uh, man, it messed me up. And this is, this is going to sting a little, but it's going to get better, okay? This is James 4, 4 through 10. And I'm going to read it from the message. I don't know if we, we found it. We did, okay? Just let this sink in. Just listen. It says, you're cheating on God if all you want is your own way. Flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God in his way. And do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he's a fiercely jealous lover. 
And what he gives in love is far better than anything else you'll find. It's common knowledge. God goes against the willful proud. God gives grace to the willing humble. So let God work his will in you. Yell a loud no to the devil and watch him scamper. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom and cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over. Get serious, really serious. I love this part. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you'll get on your feet. Man. Yeah. That's heavy, but it's good. See, here's what it says. It says you're cheating on God, flirting with the world every chance you get. And here's what I realized. Here's what I realized. When, when you allow sin in your life, that you just tolerate sin, there's things that you just let slide every single day. You're cheating on God. I started thinking about it with, with my wife, okay? Now, uh, this is the PG-13 portion. If you need to send a kid out, you can. Uh, I love intimacy with my wife. I don't know who wouldn't, right? That's part of why you get married, <laughs> because you can't do that when you're not married if you're serving Jesus. So, uh, yeah, intimacy with, with your spouse is amazing. But what if, what if every time we went out, I just flirted with other girls? I didn't do anything, but I just flirt with them everywhere we go. What up, girl? <laughs> right? And then we went home, and I'm like, hey, let's go to bed. <laughs> you think my wife is going to be very eager to go and have intimacy with me? Not at all. Not at all. Why? Because I'm flirting with other people, right? That's what God is saying. He's a jealous lover. He wants you for him. But every time you let these other things just slide and be in your life, you're flirting with them all the time. Because what, what do we do? And man, as, as a social media preacher, I, you know, I do these videos and people write me questions all the time. And the majority of the questions start off like this. Is it a sin to? Is it a sin to get tattoos? We know how I feel about that. Uh, <laughs> Is it a sin to drink alcohol? Is it a sin to smoke? Marijuana is legal now. Is it a sin to do that? They're always asking these questions. Is it a sin? And, and here's what, what all this started getting me thinking is that if God is here and then a hundred miles over here is the world in sin, why are we trying to get 99 miles and be as close to the world as we can saying, is, is this a sin? Because if it's not, look, God, I'm right here. I'm not over there. I'm not touching it. I'm at 99. Is this a sin? I want to make sure it's not. If it's not, I'm right here. I don't care about being 99 close to sin. I want to be 99 close to Jesus. I want to be so close to him that I don't care if it's a sin or not. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to flirt with it at all. But here's the thing. Some of you are like, yeah, but, you know, I've allowed this stuff and God still, he still blessed me. You're right, because he has grace. He has a ton of grace. He gives us grace all the time. I remember when I first started dating my wife, I had a lot of friends that were girls. I've always hung out with girls. Girls are easier to get along with for me, right? Sorry, dudes, they're just prettier. I don't know. <laughs> and when we first started dating, my, my wife tolerated that for a little while. You know, she understood. I wasn't trying to see them. They were just my friends. They would call or text. But I remember one day, a girl called me and my wife said, give me the phone. She wasn't my wife at the time we were dating. And she told that girl, if you ever call again, I'm going to come find you. I don't know if you know my wife or not, but she's six foot one. used to do roller derby, and she's mean. <laughs> there comes a point when a jealous lover says, that's it, no more. I will tolerate this no more. Yeah, there's grace, absolutely. But I'm telling you, there comes a point where you're not going to get any closer because that sin is keeping you separated from God. Right? So, okay, so at this point, I'm learning all this. I get on an airplane, and I said, God, I just want you to show me every sin that I've tolerated. Don't ask God to do that. <laughs> Who don't ask? I just got a pen and paper out. I'm on an airplane, folded down the little tray table, and I just started writing. And it started off pretty easy, you know, like lust, pornography. Uh, you know, I, since I became a Christian, I, 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 st I really stopped dealing with pornography. It was, it was easy. It wasn't easy to get rid of. But you know what? Every once in a while, that sucker would creep back up. I'm not going to lie to you. It would creep back in. And then, and then from there, it went into the music that you listen to. Because I would love to say I listen to worship all the time. But, uh, you know, there was times where I listened to some other stuff, old music. 
had bad words in it, but, but I didn't sing them, but I still listened to it. And then the movies that I watch, I love horror movies and all these other things. And God just started showing me, yeah, you listen to that, but I don't want to. Yeah, you watch that, but I don't want to. Then it, then it went from that, and it started getting a, a little heavier into coarse joking. The Bible says no coarse joking. And I'm like, man, I love to rag on people. <laughs> I love sarcasm. And I love kind of being rude. And he's like, I don't. I was like, oh, man. Then it got, then it got down to selfishness. Kelly, you can be pretty selfish. I'm like, oh, don't, don't say that. And they got into unforgiveness. There's people that you haven't forgiven. I'm like, God, you don't know what they did to me. And he's like, then you don't know what I did for you. <laughs> and it just kept, it kept getting worse. I mean, I'm looking at my list. And he said, complaining. Kelly, you complain everywhere you go. That's a sin, complaining, right? These are little things that we don't think of. And then the end of James 4 says, knowing what you ought to do and not doing it, that's a sin. <laughs> Ah, are you kidding me? All these little things were keeping me separated from God. And let me tell you, you have them too. It's not just me. Let's be honest. There's, there's a lot of you in this room right now that struggle with pornography, that struggle with lust. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. You don't have to because you know it's you. Oh, I mean, it's like something like eight out of ten men. It's a struggle, but we come to church every Sunday and we praise God and we go back home and we mess up and we're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And we feel bad, but then we go right back to it. We go right back to it. We go right back to it. And what is it? That's us tolerating it. We're tolerating it. And then there's things like selfishness and unforgiveness that we don't even really say we're sorry anymore. We just let it go. We just let it go. Some of us, the way that we talk, the stuff that comes out of our mouth. Man, God told me stop gossiping. And I was like, well, I don't. He goes, yeah, you might not gossip, but you listen to it, don't you? And yeah, not just about other people, but your president. Ouch. Okay. He said honor. We honor people. We respect people, including our leaders, people in authority over us. Man. He said, you don't have to do those things. They're not going to send you to hell. Drinking, smoking. I don't care if you do it. It's not going to send you to hell. Do you want intimacy with God, though? They're stopping you from getting to where you want to be. I said, all right, God, cool. I don't want that anymore. How do I deal with the sin problem? How do I deal with it? Showed me to a next scripture. Showed me Exodus 20, 20. If you want a vision for 2020, this is the beginning of it. You want 2020 vision? This is it. It says this. And this, let me give you some, some background so you understand what we're talking about. This is Moses right after God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments. He just gave them the rules, Right? Like, before this, life is good. We do what we want. No, no, no. Here's all the rules. Boom, rules. This is what he said. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. What? That's confusing. Put that back up there. That entire scripture is a contradiction. <laughs> what do you mean? Moses said, don't be afraid. God's coming so that you'll fear him. Uh, I don't understand. That doesn't make sense to me. What he's saying is that God is coming and he's giving you these rules, but don't be afraid of them. These rules are actually to keep you from sinning. But, but you can't understand that unless you understand those three words, fear of God. But I'll tell you the truth. The church has a big problem, and that is we do not understand what fear of God means. <laughs> we hear it all the time. We know it. We know the words. We read it, but we don't know what it means. You guys may have a better understanding than most churches because I know your pastor, but most people don't. Matter of fact, when I started reading that, I was like, man, I don't really know what that means, God. I need you to teach it to me. So the first thing I did was I text 10 other pastors that I'm friends with and five really close godly friends, and I just said, hey, if you had to teach the, the fear of God to somebody, how would you describe it? Half of them didn't even text me back. The other half all had different answers, and they were really weird. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it didn't even make sense. I was like, the church doesn't understand fear of God. I was like, that's the problem here. I was like, I don't understand fear of God. So I started looking up. I literally looked up every verse that had fear of God or fear of the Lord in it. That's a lot of verses. I read them all. Every one. I spent two weeks just focusing on fear of God. Let me read one of them to you. Psalms 25, 12 through 14. And I promise you I'm going to try to wrap this up. I promise. He said, who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. They will live in prosperity 
and their children will inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. Now that goes right back to where I started with I want to be a friend, not a fan. He said, I'm a friend to those who fear me. But that's confusing because doesn't your word, God, say you have not given me a spirit of fear? But now you're saying you're a friend if I fear you? Doesn't your word say perfect love casts out all fear? But now you're saying if I fear you, you will prosper me? I said, I need you to explain that to me, God. And what God showed me is that most of us see fear of the Lord like this, that I'm going to obey God because I'm so afraid what will happen if I don't. If I don't obey God, I might go to hell. I might mess up. I'm, who knows what's going to happen? I don't want to sin because I'm afraid of what's going to happen. And God said, that's not what fear of God means at all. What fear of God means is that you love him so much that you're terrified to be away from him. That you're so afraid of what life would look like if you weren't next to him. You see, what he's saying is that that we come to God out of fear with sacrifice. I will lay this down for you because I'm afraid what will happen if I don't. He said, yeah, that's great, but I don't want your sacrifice. I want obedience. You see, fear will not sustain you. Love will sustain you. Love for the Father will sustain you. And this, and this man, it just got so good after that. Because I was like, okay, God, I need a way to teach this. How do I teach this to people? And, and God told me, he said, teach it like this. Fear, what fear means is forget everything and run. Forget everything and run. Because what do we do when we're afraid? We forget everything and run. And if you're serving God out of fear of what will happen, if you don't, guess what will happen? You will forget everything and eventually run away from him. You see, that's the point is that that sentence is not complete. You get to complete it. You can forget everything and run away if you're scared of God and you're serving him out of fear that way. Or if you're serving him out of a love and reverence that he's so amazing, that you love him so much, then you can forget everything in your past, every sin you've ever tolerated, and you can run to him because you love him so much. You see, Christian burnout is very real. It's very real. And what this showed me is why it happens. And it happened to me all the time as a kid. I would be in youth group, and every Wednesday I would get saved. <laughs> Every single Wednesday, I'm at the altar. Every Wednesday night, I'm breaking CDs and ripping up magazines and breaking up with evil girlfriends. <laughs> and by Friday, I've given all that up and I'm right back to everything else. Because I realize being afraid of God only lasts for this long because you can't do it on your own. You cannot make this life work on your own. Fear doesn't sustain you and that's why we burn out. It's love. It's the love of the Father that's going to sustain you, right? So I will, uh, I will conclude with this, if you will. And I, I use the word conclude because I read somewhere that when you say conclude, 70% of your audience will re-engage with you. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm still here. I'll conclude with this. What I realized is that I think us as a church, as Christians, we have a repentance problem. We are real good at saying sorry, but we do not know how to repent. We're real good about going to God and confessing, but confession is not repenting. Confession is just telling God what you've done. And that's great. That's awesome. But if one of my kids came and took money out of my wallet, and I was like, hey, what happened? And they're like, man, dad, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I did that. And I'm like, you know what? It's okay. You're forgiven. And the next day they did it again. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. You're forgiven. And the next day they did it again. At some point I'll be like, you're not really sorry, are you? We just keep doing it. And that's exactly what we do every single day. We're real good about saying sorry and confessing, but what God tells us is that we need to have true repentance, meaning that we actually need to separate ourselves and turn from that life, turn from those sins and walk in the opposite direction. 
make a choice to turn in your spirit, in your soul, in your mind and go a different direction. It's time to stop serving God and be a friend of God. There's a scripture where Jesus tells the disciples, you're no longer a servant, but you're my friends. I never really understood that until now. He's saying there's a point in our relationship now, you've been with me so long that you're not just serving and working for me for something, but now we're friends. Now we've crossed into a level of intimacy where we know each other, where we're friends. And I'm telling you, there's so many fans of Jesus that are just sitting here serving and serving and serving, and that's great. But what he's saying is, I really want intimacy with you, and I really want to be your friend. How many of you want to be a friend of God and not just a fan? Amen, me too. You can bow your heads. I'm going to pray for you real quick. But before I pray for you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want you to think for a minute. I just want you to start thinking about your life. And if there's any sins in your life that you are realizing right now that you've just tolerated, that you've just let them go, you are realizing it now that maybe you didn't before, that there are some things keeping you from the intimacy with God that you want. There are some things keeping you from true friendship and intimacy with God. What are those things in your life? We come to church and we sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. And we walk back out and serve God right back out of fear. I want you to leave today singing, I'm no longer a slave to fear and mean it because you're serving out of love out of a reverence. What sins have you tolerated? I'm going to pray for you. I'm going I'm to ask two questions before I pray them. And the first one is this. You may be sitting in this room today and you are realizing that you've never actually given your life to Jesus. That you realize you've been coming to the club. You've been doing all the right things. You, you hang out with a lot of people that probably are friends with Jesus, but... You're just kind of a fan. You've just been close, but haven't really been intimate. And you're saying, you know what? I actually want to give everything to him. I want to ask him into my heart today. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the 500th time. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Maybe you're thinking, well, I need to get some of these sins cleaned up first. No, no, no. No, you don't. He's ready for you right now. Matter of fact, you can't clean them up without him. So good luck. What he's saying is that Jesus is ready. Now's your time. Now's your time. There may not be another time, honestly. I can't promise you tomorrow's coming. I can't promise you this afternoon will be here. I can barely promise you this moment, barely. So if that's you and you're sitting here today and you're like, you know what? That's it. I'm gonna give everything to him. I want a friend. I want a friend in Jesus. That's me. If that's you, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one's looking around, just raise your hand. I'm gonna pray with you. If that's you, I see you. I see you, 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 I see you. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. Anyone else? I see you. Man, God's stirring my heart. I can't move yet. I can't go yet. Anybody else? He's waiting on you. I see you back there. Anybody else? I've got time. There you are. I see you. There you are. I see you. God, I thank you right now for every single person that raised their hand saying that they want a friend in you, that they are giving their life to you. Lord Jesus, I thank you that your word says the only thing we have to do to enter into a relationship with you is believe you are who you say you are and ask you into our hearts. It's that simple. There's no magic words. There's no magic pixie dust. We just believe and you come into our hearts. So right now, I want everyone in this room to repeat after me. And if you're praying this today, asking Jesus into your heart, I'm telling you, when you say this prayer and you ask him to come in, your life will be changed forever. You are starting on a brand new journey in a whole new world. It's the best decision you've ever made. Your life will not become easier, but you're going to have a helper and a friend to get you through every storm and trial like you've never had before. So just repeat after me, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for giving your life for me. 
Today I give you my life. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my past. Make me new. I want to be your friend. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for changing me. I love you. The next question I want to ask is if you're sitting here in this room today and you have realized that you have tolerated sins that have kept you from God and you truly want to repent, you truly want to turn from them and you want to be a friend, not a fan, you're ready to step into that next section of life with Jesus. You're ready to turn from it and walk away. God has started to show things. He's, tur- he's stirred stuff up in you. If that's you, what's going to happen is I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And you are like, no way. I don't want to stand up. Let's raise our hand with heads bowed tonight closed. There's a reason I want you to stand up. And that's because when you leave today, as soon as you walk out of these doors, Satan is going to start lying to you. And he's going to say, you're not forgiven of that. You haven't repented of that. Nothing has changed. You're still the same. I'm going to get you. As soon as you get home, you're going to turn on the computer. You're going right back to the same things. You're still going to talk about that person. You still feel the same way. You're still selfish. You're still greedy. He's going to start lying to you. But what's going to happen is when you stand up, when you leave, you've got ammunition. You can say, nope, I stood up in front of everybody and they saw me make the choice to choose to be friends with Jesus and to turn my back on everything else. No, Satan, you're a liar. You're wrong. James 4 said, yell a loud no to to Satan, a quiet yes to Jesus and he'll be there. See, James 4 also says this, draw close to God and he will draw near to you. Do you realize where the action begins? On you. I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, I want you to stand up. One. I don't care if you're the only person in the room that stands up. It's going to be worth it. The freedom that's going to come, the chains falling off your life, the intimacy that you're going to receive is worth it. Two, I don't care what it is that you're struggling with. This is the freedom you've been waiting for. This is the time you've been waiting for. Three, right now, if that's you and you are ready to get free, stand up. Stand up. We've got time for you. We've got time. Who else? Anybody else? Praise God. Everybody, you open, turn on the lights. Turn them on. Open your eyes. Look around. Look around at the people that are standing up. These are the people that are getting free today. These are the people that Jesus is setting free today, that are entering into a friendship with him today. And the reason that I want you to look around is because what the enemy does is when you're struggling with these sins, when you're struggling with these issues, he tells you you're the only one. It's just you. Don't say anything to anyone else because it'll ruin your job. It'll ruin your family. It'll ruin your career. You'll lose your friends. I can't tell you how many times on a Sunday I would go to preach and I sat on the front row praying to God, God, forgive me. I messed up last night. Please just anoint me so I can preach. I spent the whole time praying that he would just get me right so I could get up here. Today I spent time in his presence saying, fill me up so I can pour it out. I'm... This is your family. This is your support. Everyone's dealing with the same stuff. It's not just you. Man, everyone that's standing up, I just feel like God just wants me to tell you no longer do I call you servants. I call you my friends. I call you my friends. Let me pray over you. I'm going to send you out. If you're still sitting down, I believe that's because you already got this. And I, man, amen, I'm so proud of you. I'm excited for you. So if you're still sitting down, reach your hands out to those who are standing up. And if you're sitting down and you know you need to stand up, there's still time. So stand up. Ain't no big deal. No one's going to be mad at you. No one's judging you. We're happy for you. So just reach out to those that are standing and we're going to pray. God, I thank you. God, I thank you so much that your love is so good that we do not have to be afraid of you, that we do not have to run from you in fear, that we don't have to serve you because we're afraid of what happens if we don't. God, I thank you that your love is so good, that it's so good that we are just terrified to be away from you. God, I thank you that every single person here that is standing up, you just give them a fresh anointing of your love, a fresh peace, a fresh joy to see you in a way that they never have before. 
that they can truly turn from anything they've allowed in their life, not because they're sacrificing it or laying it down, but because they don't want anything in their life that would keep them from being close to you. God, let them see you in a brand new way. Let them experience you in a brand new way. God, I thank you for a fresh boldness, a fire, and a love on everyone that's standing and double for everyone that's sitting. God, we love you today. Thank you for the changes you've made right here in this room. We love you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's, let's give a hand clap for what God's doing today. Man, I'm so excited to get to share this message with you. You have no idea how it's just been burned in my soul. And those of you that made this decision today, I'm telling you, once I got this, God started speaking to me like never before. He was crazy. Doors started opening for me like never before. I can't even begin to tell you. Get ready. Get ready for what God's about to do in your life. Being a friend of God, the Bible says that he'll start sharing secrets with you. Because you, you don't tell secrets to people you don't know. You share secrets with your friends. And not all secrets are bad. They're good secrets. God's going to start sharing good secrets with you. And they're awesome. Amen. Thank you for letting me come hang out with you today. I appreciate it.